Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight we're honored to have two of the finest artists of stage and screen. They both distinguish themselves in highly dramatic roles. But in tonight's play, Holy Matrimony, we're presenting Charles Lawton and Faye Banker in a gay comedy from the 20th Century Fox Studios. A romantic adventure which develops when a wealthy and famous artist decides to assume the identity of his own valet. Now, Act One of Holy Matrimony, starring Charles Lawton as Priam Farrell and Faye Bainter as Alice. This is the curious and incredible story of one of England's greatest painters, Mr. Priam Farrell. And while I had never met Mr. Farrell, it had been my honor as an art dealer to represent him for many years. Mr. Farrell shunned society. Dreading acclaim and publicity, he was making his home in the year 1905 on a tiny tropical island somewhere off the coast of New Zealand. His only companion was his valet, Henry Leeson. The day came, however, when I dispatched an urgent message that he return at once to London. You are going to read the letter, Mr. Farrell? Or shall I just drop it into the sea? I assume you've already read it. Ah, uh, yes, sir. I steamed it open over the tea kettle. Why do you bother? Don't you find my letters dreadfully dull? Frightfully so, sir. But your position is somewhat different from mine, sir. You delight in this isolation. Well, I'm a most sociable character. Our existence in these uh, suburbs of civilization, with only yourself and a few anteaters for company, is one that I've never been able to accept a wholeheartedly. Come along now, Lee. Give it a fair chance. Twenty-five years, sir? Not really. Has it been as long as that? Asia. Africa, America, Patagonia, and now the Antipodes. Twenty-five glorious years of peace and solitude. And yet, Leek, under certain circumstances, I shouldn't mind seeing London again. In view of this letter, sir, that is a most fortunate observation. It says, sir, you are to return to London immediately. Who says so this time? That robber who calls himself an art dealer? Mr. Oxford encloses a request from His Majesty the King of England. Sir, you are to be knighted. Knighted! I deplore crowds and ceremony. I couldn't possibly face such an ordeal. Drop him a note, Cleek. Thank him, of course. The honor and all that under the circumstances. Is he a knighthood, sir? That just isn't done. Not even by you. This is most annoying. According to Mr. Oxford, there is a steamship leaving Auckland on April the 17th. Oh, you may start packing, Leek. What a miserable mess. I received a cable from Mr. Fowle from Auckland. Swearing me to secrecy, he ordered me to lease suitable lodgings in London and to advise him accordingly. Under no conditions was I to tell anyone of his arrival or whereabouts, nor would I be permitted to meet him. And so it was that after 25 years, the distinguished artist returned to England. His arrival, however, was marked by tragedy. Henry Leek, his valet, was taken gravely ill. Oh, come along now, Leek. A day or two in bed, you'll be as nimble as ever. Do stop groaning and go to sleep. It's pneumonia, isn't it, sir? I heard what he said. That doctor you found... Oh, the chap's a perfect wizard. You'll have me cured in no time. I'm frightfully sorry, sir. Doing this to you on the very eve of, of your being knighted. Oh, you must Leek, must you remind me? Mr. Farl, I... I'm afraid I have a, a confession or two to make. Don't you be a fool. Never make a confession until you actually feel rigor mortis setting in. <laughs> you might recover. I'm done for, sir. I know it. You're going to get well. I insist upon it. Now, if you don't put your mind to it, you could be out of here and off to late city carker tomorrow night. You make life sound so, so attractive, Mr. Fowl. But there are certain facts about me, sir, that you really should you stop this ridiculous melodrama at once and sit up. <laughs> I'll fetch you another drink of the best brand. <laughs> now, whatever it was that Henry Leap was so anxious to confess, it remained a secret. But ten hours later, the poor man was dead. Sometimes happens this way, you know. Chief W. Nunya over in the matter of hours. What'll I do without him, Doctor? I simply don't know. We've been together so long. There was no pain. He nearly fell asleep. Thank heaven for that. Now, where will one find Mr. Fowle's relatives? Hmm? What did you say? His relatives. They have to be notified. Uh, 
Mr. Fowle's relative. Yes, of course, Mr. Fowle's relative. Hadn't he any? Uh, only a distant cousin, I believe, Frederick Duncan, a solicitor. They hadn't seen each other since they were boys. Do you know his address? Temple Inn, I believe. I take it you were Mr. Fowle's valet? Yes, sir. Uh, here's your first name, please. Priam. Priam Fowle? The painter? The one who is to be knighted tomorrow? By Jove, my wife won't be half thrilled over this. She's passionately fond of art and all that muck. Is she indeed? A pity I couldn't have pulled him through. I might have persuaded him to come to one of her teas. He'd have had a high old time together. Duffy, wasn't he? Duffy? Cracked a bit. Brian Fowle was universally regarded as one of the soundest men of this or any other generation. Well, didn't I read somewhere that he ran away from England years ago to marry a Fiji witch or something? It's far more likely, sir, that he ran away from England to escape your wife. <laughs> Great Scott, did he know Maybell? Well, speak, sir, in hyperbole. Oh, oh, naturally, naturally. <laughs> no half feelings, huh? Oh, no, not at all. Oh, well, um, I, I'll attend to all the formalities, death certificate, registrar, etc., etc., etc. Well, uh, good day, Mr. Oh. Oh, there's a letter under the door. Mr. Henry Leak, it says. This must be for you. Oh, thank you again, sir. Uh, not at all. Not at all. The letter had been posted in the suburb, in Putney. The handwriting was obviously a woman. Mr. Farl opened the envelope and read the contents. Dear Mr. Leak, I think the photograph you sent me is most gentlemanly, so I enclose one of mine. I am glad your gentleman has decided to come back from abroad. And I shall please to meet him, you suggest. How about outside the Empire Music Hall on Saturday evening? In case my photograph is too flattering. Ah, ah. I shall wear red roses in my act. Yours sincerely, Alice Chen. P.S. I am a widow of ten years standing. Yes. There are always a lot of dark spots in the Empire. I have no doubt you'll be able to gentlemen should. Excuse me. I merely mention it just in case. Yes. Thanks to a matrimonial bureau, Henry Leake had entertained hope that his return to England would not be lacking in moments of romance. Now, whatever Mr. Fowle may have thought of that letter, other matters of far greater impact soon were to descend. The doctor had made rather a serious mistake. Henry Leake had died, but the name inscribed on the death certificate was Priam Fowle, and Mr. Fowle had made not the slightest effort to correct the error. To him, it was a heaven-sent opportunity to escape knighthood and the pomp and acclaim that most certainly would follow. But even Mr. Farr, with all his awareness of his own artistic genius, had not counted on what his death would mean to England. The nation was plunged into mourning. And all day long, London's noblest citizens came to view the earthly remains now reposing in the drawing room. It was one of the most enjoyable days that Priam Fowle had ever experienced. So when the last of the mourners had departed, two gentlemen remained. One of them was Fowle's cousin, Fenwick Duncan. Now then, my good man, no doubt you're concerned about your future. Mm. And you've noticed I'm giving you a month's wage. Now, you stop the nonsense, Frederick, and tell me who that stale-looking fellow is in there. He's Mr. Parley from The Undertakers, and my name to you, sir, is Mr. Duncan. It, it, it's no use. I, I can't go through with this. Mr. Farl's will has been located. It provides you with three pounds a week for life, an extremely generous allowance. Now, if you call to my office next week, Will I you make... kindly shut up and listen to me? Do I? What? Well, look at me. Don't you recognize me? All very difficult and stupid, I suppose, but the truth is that I'm not Henry Leake at all. I'm, uh, Priam. Cousin Priam. Are you insane? Priam Fall is dead. That's leak in there. They're burying the wrong corpse. 
know it is rather amusing at first, the doctor's ridiculous mistake at home, since they're making such a fuss about me. Uh, uh, Mr. Parler, uh, Mr. Parler, uh, what is he talking about? Obviously, the man suffering from shock. Oh, he was with Cousin Prime for years. The tragedy's unbalanced. I'll, I'll go for the doctor. And while you're about it, you might look up that art dealer, Clive Oxford. Tell Oxford you that idiot. I'm... Don't you realize Mr. Oxford being summoned to Westminster Abbey to assist with the arrangement? What arrangements? His Majesty has ordered that the remains of my departed cousin shall lie forever in the hallowed company. Call it off at once. You, you will hear me, Fenwick. I, I, at once, Henry Leake was an excellent valley, but they can't put him in Westminster Abbey. Not in my corner, they can't. Oh. <laughs> I'm warning you, Leake. One more outburst. I just I, told you the I, doctor made a mistake, all right. I should have stopped it. But Westminster Abbey. Uh, uh, yes, 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 of course. Now, uh, why don't you sit down, eh? I, I think uh, there's some port wine in the pantry. Uh, have some, my good fellow. Oh, uh, parlor, forget the doctor. Get a policeman. This man's on him. Thank you, miserable bird brain. Can't you understand? Take your hand off me. I'm warning you, Leake. I'll tell my life here, eh? Parley, for heaven's sake, get the policeman. <laughs> Triumphal had had quite enough. He booted his cousin, ran out the back door, and disappeared. If his own flesh wouldn't listen to him, well, let them bury Henry Leake in Westminster Abbey. Three days later, the services were conducted, and since it was his own funeral, Priam Fowle had an understandable desire to attend. But Mr. Fowle, however, had no invitation. No, 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 no. What's all this about? It's him, Sergeant. He threatened to assault me for not allowing him to enter the Abbey. Well, yeah, what about it? You got a ticket, Dad? What did you call me? I said, Ed, you got a ticket for the funeral. No, it's as well as a guest of honor. He's have to have... drunk, if you ask me. Who asked you? Have you no shame? Don't you realize what's going on in there? Yeah, well, you. Let's have a smell of your breath. I am not drunk, nor have I the slightest intention of allowing you the privilege of smelling my breath. What's your name? I may. You have one, haven't you? No. At least not one that I care to give at the moment. Why, Mr. Lee, good morning. Uh, your oh. pardon us, madam. Stand aside, please. Oh, this man is... Mr. Lee, if you don't mind. This man is drunk and disorderly. What's more... Oh, oh, Mr. Lee doesn't drink. He was simply overcome. I expect no one there was such a loss. Thanks, you, madam. And uh, what loss was that, if I may ask? My oh, goodness, don't tell me you don't know who he is. Well... Mr. Priam Fowle's valet, that's who he is. For 25 years, Mr. Fowle never made a move, never a decision, never had a book without first talking it over with Mr. Leake here. Yeah, but he, he had no ticket. Been no more shame. After the best years of his life, giving every satisfaction, and what is his reward? No ticket for the funeral. But why didn't they tell me? Because I don't like policemen. Mr. Leake is a very shy man. Well, I'm very sorry, sir. No, 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 no harm, then, sir. Uh, would you like me to take you in, sir? No. I've lost all interest. Well, you go right along with the lady, then. Thank you, Sergeant. <laughs> I do hope you don't think I felt this was necessary. Luncheon, I mean, and, and in fact, an empty rest. Oh, nonsense, Mrs. Chalice, nonsense. Have you found something that you like on the menu? Strange. May I take your order, madam? Um, I, uh, I think I'll have some of this. That, madam, is the name of the selection the orchestra is playing. <laughs> Not much nourishment in that. Will you order for me, Mr. Lick, anything at all? Well, let's start with orders. Uh, then we better have a uh, waiter. You'll be back. I suppose I insulted him. Oh, ooh. Just look at these prices. Well? Are you sure you can afford it? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Did they give you your month? My month? Oh, you're entitled to it, you know, no matter what happens. Oh, yes, I was provided for in the will. Well, it doesn't matter. I simply don't want you to be extravagant for my sake. There's no call for it. I'm just as I am, just as you see me now. And no amount of foolish spending would affect me one way or the other. You understand, don't you? Well, of course I do. Would you be good enough to tell me now how you recognized me? Oh, very easily. You're exactly like your photograph. I am. Oh, I knew you at once. But the beard, of course. And also your shyness. I have a photograph right here in my purse. See? But this photograph is... is, is two of you, yes. You and poor Mr. Paul together. 
Oh, yes, I, I, I see. I, I, I see I wrote an inscription. Don't you remember writing it? Oh, of course I do. Of course. I am my gentleman, expectantly yours, Henry. I think it's very good of you. You're a very imposing figure, you know. Almost dashing, one might say. Am I indeed? Huh. Waiter, come here at once. Waiter, Mr. Lee is speaking to you. that England buried Henry Leake's valet in Westminster Abbey. And so it was that Triumph Fowl met Alice Chalice, luncheoned with her, and later fired her home to the pretty little house in Putney. Why, uh, this is just delightful. It's delightful. What more? You, 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 you brew an excellent cup of tea. Thank you, dear. I can't get over that restaurant. Why, such prices are scandalous. And that fish. <laughs> there is no more soul than your bowl of that. Dear me, I thought it was rather tasty. For anyone who hasn't been used to good cooking for that. You haven't told me yet. But I fancy you've never been married. No, I haven't. You've always lived like this, just traveling about with a home and nobody to take care of you properly? Oh, one gets accustomed to it. Yes, I can understand that. No responsibilities. I can understand that, yeah. too. But I do feel sorry for you all these years. Tell me about Mr. Fowl. Well, the truth of the matter is that Priam Fowl, for all his magnificent talents, was not a happy man. I suppose not, poor fellow. He, all he wanted, actually, was to paint and to be left alone, but that didn't seem to be possible in London, and he, he loved London very deeply. For instance, Priam Fowl, God rest his great, tormented soul. Would never have been allowed to enjoy it today as this. Uh, a painter, my dear Alice, is essentially a simple fellow, a workman, and he should live as such, uh, enjoying the frugal wages, the coarse comforts, and the humble pleasures of the honest craftsman. It was a prime foul, would have loved this. <laughs> it all just goes to show. What is it all going to show? Why, they all said if I wrote a matrimonial bureau, I'd be cheated. I beg you. Oh, yes, the matrimonial bureau, yes. Of course. I like it. If you want to get married, it's no use pretending you don't. There's no shame in wanting to get married. It's sensible and it's normal. And in such a case, a matrimonial bureau is a good and useful institution. Well, if you were to ask me, I don't... I don't have to ask. Why? You thought so, too, evidently. And so do I. And I'm sure that anything comes of this, I'll pay the fee with the greatest of pleasure. <laughs> what about you? So you are a most unusual woman. Very well. Most unusual woman. I said, what about you, Henry? The fee? Mm. The greatest of pleasure. Act two of Holy Matrimony in a moment. Make a friend, and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. Louis Cass knew how important friendship is. In 1836, he resigned as Secretary of War to accept the post of Ambassador to France. It wasn't too long after his arrival there that he became friends with King Louis Philippe. But making friends with the French people was another story. Anti-American propaganda had been too well planted over the years. But one day, Cass witnessed a street fight. With the appearance of armed troops, the fighters fled, leaving a group of bystanders about to be fired on. Stepping out in front of them, Cass told the commanding officer that he, as well as the Frenchmen with him, were innocent spectators, and that to fire on them would be murder. The officer apologized and ordered his men to put up their guns. The incident marked the beginning of Louis Cass's friendship with the French people. Gradually, despite the attempted smears by other nations, Cass strengthened the understanding between his country and France. And he was eventually responsible for the signing of a treaty by America, France, and England, a treaty which guaranteed freedom of the seas to all nations. Once more, an American had proved to the world that by helping others, you help your country. Now our guest producer, Mr. Kerry Wilson. Act two of Holy Matrimony. Starring Charles Lawton as Priam Farrell and Faye Bainter as Alice. Twelve months have passed.
past since that memorable day when I stood in Westminster Abbey under the impression, along with the rest of the British Empire, that I was witnessing the burial of Priam Fowle. Priam Fowle was not only alive, but under the name of Henry Leake, was now married and with a charming wife living blissfully in Putney. And then one day, visitors arrived. Is this Mr. Henry Leake? Yes. And you're not going to keep us out. Walk right in, Mother. What on earth? Now, where is he? Well, never mind where he is. Who are you? Carl. Who are we, she asked? I'm his wife, ma'am. And the rightful Mrs. Link. And Harry and not here are Henry son. And did you have a nice stroll, sweetie? Oh, excellent, dear. We have visitors, Henry. Visitors? Old friends of yours, they say. Well, don't you recognize her? And lovely. I'm afraid that you have the advantage, madam. Thirty years. Thirty years does make a change in one's appearance. She says she's your wife, dear. And these young gentlemen are your two sons. Great heavens! It's the beard, of course. And you are heavier, Henry. But your eyes. Ah, your eyes are just. Madam, I have never had the debatable pleasure of ever seeing you before in my entire life. Then how do you explain this, sir? A marriage certificate. But father see. You dare refer to me as your father. Look at the paper. It means nothing to me, whatever. You will not deny that your name is Henry Lee? I deny everything, no matter what you say, I deny it. Uh, are you sure you recognize my husband? Well, I, I can't be sure as I recognize him exactly. He was only 23 when I saw him last. But he's the same sort of man. And his eyes, uh, they're the same. Then examine my nose. <laughs> Probably you should recognize that also. Do you go on? Look closely. Do you? Well, I can't say. I remember it being so bony and all. Can a man change his nose? All flesh is grass. This discussion does not concern grass. But you were a valet to a gentleman, I, Mr. Prime Farm, the painter, weren't you? Well, uh, Well, that's what my husband was doing. Last time I heard of him. Madam, I repeat, I not only deny everything that has been said, but also everything that will be said, and now I shall take my leave of this absurd. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, well, now, we can all have a nice cup of tea. Here you are, Mrs. Uh, Leek. Thank you, I'm sure. Well, I hope it's the way you... What else? Oh, gee, how could I be so clumsy? Oh, and your dress. Oh, my. Oh, you get me a cloth from the kitchen. Hurry now. Oh, yes, by all means. Oh, the now stand over for yes. the fire, Mrs. Leek. You'll dry out in a jiffy. Oh, dear. And you, sir? Mm. I'll uh, pour my own, if you don't mind. Sugar. Two sugars. Are they only coming back? Who? Father. I shouldn't think so. I imagine he's gone for a stroll. He usually does, you know. That's rather strange. He was getting a cloth. He's a rather peculiar man. Oh, he has his good point. But now that he's gone, well, oh, far be it for me to say a word against him. He's often quite kind to me. But there's no denying. Ah! <gasps> Once he twisted my arm terribly. And one man. Snatched up iron off of my arm. Oh, and I would please. I know all that you can tell me. I know because I've been through it. And he's not changed in all these years. You know, sometimes I don't think he's quite right in their sheet. I seldom get up in the morning without thinking that, well, perhaps today you'll have to be taken off. Taken <laughs> can off. To the asylum. Oh. oh, I am sorry for you young men. Sorry? Hey, if you're his son, it's the same blood. Oh. oh, I should watch myself very carefully if I were you. Oh. You want him back, of course, because you have first claim on him. Oh, yes, of course. Yes, and if I... you can make him see his duty, you're quite welcome to him. The fact remains he should be prosecuted for bigamy. Oh, by all means. Although... You are students, are you? We both are both students at a seminar. A seminar? Oh, I don't suppose it was matter. Oh, would it? A father in prison for bigamy? Let's get out of here. Come along, Mother. We're going home. <laughs> it's all right, Henry. 
You can come in now. As I give you my word of honor, I never saw that woman before in all my life. Of course not. And I don't blame you for the second. Darling, did the, don't you believe me? Of course, dear. Only I hope there won't be many more of them. Great Scott. So do I. <laughs> That was the last of Mrs. Leek and her two strapping offspring. But Triumph Fowl now had a rather good idea of what Henry Leek had been so anxious to confess to him. Well, another calm and happy year rolled by, and then Alice received a letter in the mail. I wish you'd look at it, Henry. It's a business letter, dear. What? Cahoon's Brewery Company? That's where I have my money, love. Dear shareholder, owing to a lamentable temperance wave which has been sweeping the country, Cahoon's Brewery Company has been able to declare its customary annual dividend on ordinary shares. Well, it simply means they're not declaring a dividend. Oh, that's out of the question. I have my dividend. I may, too. This is terrible. How on earth can a brewery have financial trouble? <laughs> that's just what father used to say. Put your faith in an Englishman's thirst. It's gold in the bank, he said. And the, everything we have is in brewery shares. Well, it's still my three pounds a week. Bless your heart, darling. I need much more than that. It's the payment on this house, and it's due in May. Alice, if we can't meet the payment, does it mean we shall have to get out? Oh, no. Other houses, Henry. Not for me. This is the house I like. This is the house I'm happy in. Alice, I refuse to move. Uh, we the whole month yet. I I, 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 I could earn some money, you know. Henry Wendell Leak. If you think I'd let you take another situation, you're very much mistaken. Well, what I have in mind, well, it, it, it does involve a certain measure of risk. Nothing crooked, Henry. I was thinking of painting. Oh, no, darling. I'd never have a minute's peace. You're much too old to go climbing up and down ladders. <laughs> Not painting houses, Alice. Uh, pictures. Now you smoke your pipe and read the paper, love. I'll go and get dinner. Henry, dear, you've scarcely touched your breakfast. Don't you feel well? There's nothing wrong with my health, Alice, save the normal ravages of time, sin, and a petrified liver. And the point is that I have to tell you something. Alice, my name is not Henry Leake. Oh, it isn't. But what does it matter as long as you haven't committed a murder or anything? My real name is Priam Fowl. Oh. Wasn't that your gentleman's name? Alice, listen to me carefully, dear. When Henry Leake died, the doctor made a mistake and I didn't correct him well, because I didn't want to be Priam Fowl anymore. In fact, I was downright sick of being Priam Fowl. And I, I tell you this so you'll understand when I say that I can paint and make a little money that I'm not being altogether barmy. Then Henry Leake is buried in Westminster Abbey. That is a somewhat quaint fact, my angel. And you've never said a word about this to anyone? Not to anyone who'd listened. Now, it is sweet of you to tell me all about it, and I understand the whole thing. Did you know what I'd do if I were you? I'm not a loony, if that's what you've got in your mind. Now, if I were you, I would never again mention a word of this to anyone. I just forget it. But it's the truth. And above all, you must stop worrying about this. Not at all, Alice. I'll prove it to you. I'm not questioning it. All I'm saying is that it doesn't matter. No, I, I refuse to live the rest of my days as foolish Phil the village idiot. But Henry... I have incontrovertible evidence of my true identity. Alice, you and I are going up to the attic. But what's in the attic? Not dear? another word you see for yourself. Come along. Well, my goodness. Will you just look at this attic? Painting all over the place. Well, I, ha I, I, I have a confession, sweetheart. I, I can't live unless I paint her ever since we've been married. You I... sneaked up here and had your little fun. Well, not always up here. In and about town, anywhere I could find something that I wanted to put on canvas. How, uh, how does this one strike you? It's just lovely. What is it? <laughs> what is it? Why, why it's Putney Bridge. Isn't it? It is. On rather a peculiar day, I imagine. Oh, but it's very nice, Henry. Very nice indeed. Thank you. And it's a pity you didn't put an omnibus on the bridge. But there is an omnibus on the bridge. There is? Oh. There. It stopped, I suppose. 
Yes, dead still. <laughs> but it's very nice in this. I suppose you learn from your gentleman, Mr. Paul. Alice, well, would, would it surprise you to know that this canvas is worth at the very least 1,000 pounds? Yes. And, my love, don't you realize that you can get real pictures of lakes and even mountains by real artists for two pounds a piece at the frame maker? Two pounds, dash it, Alice. I've got two thousands of things, not nearly as good as this one. Darling, I don't want you to worry like this. We'll get the money somehow. Please, please, don't worry. And no matter what happens, I'll always take care of you, no matter what. No, thank you. Thank you, my sweet dear. Uh, come on, and, and get your hat and coat. And I'll never let them take you away. We're, we're, we're going to the frame makers, and I'm going to prove this to you once and for all. Ah, oh, good day, sir. Something in a picture frame? Here, within this wrapping, is a painting, and I want uh, you to tell us what you think of it. Well, I can hardly claim to be an expert, sir. You are vaguely familiar with oil paintings, are you not? Very well. Uh, what about this one? Well, now. <clears throat> oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, might I ask where you acquired this? No. Well, very good. Is it a copy? Is it? It's either a copy or a remarkable imitation. Would you be good enough to put a price upon it? Mm, two pounds. What? A uh, five. Sir. Ten? You'll give him ten pounds for it? Yes, madam. That'll be all, thank you. Oh, but Henry... Come along, my love. Fifteen pounds? Henry, fifteen pounds? Do you suppose he's crazy? Mad as a March hare. In the weeks that followed, Alice spent many troubled moments up in the attic. She studied the paintings with the utmost charity, but it was no use. Alice simply could not understand how a man in his right mind would offer 15 pounds for anything so amateurish. But 15 pounds was 15 pounds, so unknown to her husband, Alice began selling his paintings to the frame maker. In turn, he sold them to me. But then developed an unhappy situation that left me no alternative but to visit the artist in his home in Putney. I will tell you again, Mr. Oxford, I haven't the slightest idea what you're talking about. Well, then, suppose you look at this painting I brought along. It's called The Bridge in Putney. Now, in my opinion, it's one of the finest files in existence. Well, well it is a masterpiece, of course. Mm -hmm. I've been offered 5,000 pounds for it. What did you pay for it? 20 pounds. Now, if I may be seated, Mr. Leek. I'll attempt to explain my rather peculiar difficulties. Some time ago, a man named Storley, a frame maker here in Putney, came to me with a painting which I recognized at once as the work of Priam Fowl. What signed, of course. No. But Priam Fowl could not put brush to canvas without signing it indelibly with his genius. And so, of course, I bought it for 20 pounds. How much did you sell that one for? 2,000 pounds. Altogether, I bought some 30 fowls from the frame maker, for which I have received a total of about 6. Art, I see, is a very profitable business for the dealer. In this case, it can also be very profitable for the artist. And now that I've found him, I shall be delighted to give him his share. Uh, shall we say 30,000 pounds? In other words, you've been caught. Splendid. Well, there is a pending legal action, yes. Uh, Lady Vale, who bought most of the paintings, has just discovered that some of them have been painted since 1905. That's the year that you're supposed to have died. She's charging me with fraud. Excellent. I hope she wins. But this is up the... No time for levity, Mr. Power. Leak, if you please. Henry Wadsworth Leak. Sir, I have no intention whatever of being destroyed through some fantastic error in Westminster Abbey. Whoever it was buried, it was not Priam Fowl. You dare question the Abbey? I would question the Crown before seeing my business ruined. How long, may I ask, have you been suffering this odd delusion? Oh... So far as the paintings are concerned, I have never been deluded. Mr. Oxford, I can scarcely find words to express my unbounded delight in your misfortune. You have swindled your customers, the frame maker and the artist who painted the pictures. Worst of all, you have swindled the memory of that magnificent genius who lies today in England's Valhalla. For that, I can never forgive you. you you're, you're not going to deny that you are high and far. Do you know? But if you think I'm going to admit it to anyone else and surrender my peace and happiness merely to save your wretched hide and bank book, you're greatly mistaken. 
In my opinion, Joe, you're a double-dyed, triple-plated rogue and scoundrel, and I wouldn't have one finger to save you from flying in perdition for the remainder of eternity. Good day to you, sir. No, no, uh, please. Uh, Mr. Powell. Leak, sir. Henry Greenleaf Leak. <laughs> Final act of holy matrimony will follow. You'll probably remember when the waves of the North Sea burst through Holland's dikes and turned the little country into a land of terror. It was Western Europe's worst flood disaster. More than 1,400 people were killed, and over 60,000 were made homeless. The property loss was greater than that suffered during World War II. But America answered the call from the Dutch people. Within just a few hours, United States Army helicopters were evacuating hundreds from the danger areas. Mercy planes filled with blankets, coats, shoes, and food brought quick relief in the emergency. Among the many who contributed was the 82nd Airborne Division. They remembered the courage and the help displayed by the Dutch people when they parachuted into Holland in 1944. This one unit collected nearly 20,000 pounds of clothing and over $12,000 in cash for relief in the flooded country. Now, there was no official drive behind this operation. It emerged right from the heart, a spontaneous, genuine reaction to a country struck by disaster. It proved once more that in the hour of need, people will reach across borders and oceans to help their fellow men. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. I had no particular wish either to annoy or embarrass a man whose genius I so admired. But I was facing a suit in a court of law. My attorney had no choice but to call on Mr. Powell and serve him with a subpoena. Dear, has the gentleman gone? Come in, Alice. Yes, he's gone. And so now you know, hmm? You thought I was a uh, loony, didn't you? I thought you weren't quite well. I shouldn't have done it, I suppose. But there were those paintings and the picture frame. I gave me 15 pounds a piece for them. I didn't want you worrying about me. You're, you're a dear sweet girl. What's going to happen? Nothing. Oxford is going to be sued and all probability will be sent to prison. I hope. <laughs> I told him flatly that I'd have nothing to do with it. Do you realize that he was making 10,000% on my work? 10,000%. I had no idea percentages ran that high. <laughs> I should have known you weren't a ballot. You've always been so much of a gentleman and so... so useless. <laughs> Alice, what's the matter, dear? You, you Surely you don't think that this will make any any difference between us? No. Well, why, why should it? Oh, I don't know. We're bound to be, Henry. Or should I see Priam? I've told you I have no intention whatever of getting mixed up in this business. But it's Mrs. Priam Powell. The wife of a great gentleman. So great that he could be buried in Westminster Abbey. I don't know. I don't know how I'd be. Not much, I expect. Like I couldn't be a duchess or a bareback rider. I can't feel that I'd be much use to you anymore. That is the most ridiculous rot I've ever heard. Well, I might be uncomfortable or too ignorant. I couldn't stand that. Then we'll go away to Borneo or someplace like that. I'd, uh, I just want to be with you. Well, then, Primer, we'll see. Meanwhile, you know, I expect there'll be a terrible fuss in the papers. I mean, about the poor man in Westminster. Did I ask to be buried in Westminster? I know, dear, I'm sure you didn't. Will I ever ask this peace and quiet and the chance to paint a picture now and then? But no, an art dealer whom I loathe gets sued for fraud. My life is made unbearable. Why? I don't know. So they think they can get me to help them in court, eh? Well, you just wait. You just wait till I get in that witness stand. <laughs> trial began, and a certain Mr. Pennington, the complainant's lawyer, enunciated the charges. May it please the court, this is an action brought by Lady Vale to recover the sum of 42,000 pounds, paid by her to Mr. Clive Oxford, for 21 paintings, fraudulently represented to her as the work of the late Priam Farr, whose remains lie today in the hallowed halls of Western Select. But the possible consequences involved here are so monstrous that I shudder to contemplate them. Does an imposter 
A Dalit of servants rest within those sacred precincts, <laughs> so says the defendant. He would have you believe that Priam Fowl, far from being dead, is present in this very courtroom in the person of a certain bearded fellow whom it will be my pleasure to unmask as charlatan, rude, swindler, and a grave robber. <laughs> well, Lord, I should like to call my first witness. Dr. Caswell, who attended Mr. Fowl during his brief but fatal illness. Dr. Caswell, please. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I take it that you were Mr. Fowl's valet? And uh, how did he answer that, Doctor? He said, yes, sir, I was. And is that the man to whom you spoke, the bearded gentleman in the third row? Yes, that is the man. <laughs> Mr. Pennington's next witness was the Master's consort, Alice. <laughs> now then, madam, uh, how did you first meet your husband? Through a matrimonial agency. Who first had recourse to this agency? I did. With what object in mind? What do people usually go to a matrimonial agency for? I shall ask the questions, madam. I simply thought you should have known that. I went to a matrimonial agency because I wanted a husband. How's that? <laughs> do you think that was quite a nice thing to do? What do you mean by nice? Well, well, womanly, if you prefer. And do you think that asking a rude and unnecessary question is the gentlemanly thing to do? <laughs> Under what name did this man write you? Leek. Under what name did he marry you? Leek. Under what name have you lived with him since that marriage? Leek. Then, in your opinion, what is his name? I can't tell you. You mean you don't know? Certainly I know. You refuse to say. That's it. My Lord. <laughs> uh, madam, may I ask why you refuse to answer? Politeness, I should say. Indeed. My Lord, I feel that it would be a bit impudent of me to say who my husband is when the whole object of this trial is to decide that for me. <laughs> the next witness was Priam Fowler's cousin, Fennec Duncan. <laughs> now then, Mr. Duncan, uh, you uh, definitely recognize the man in the coffin, the man they interred in Westminster Abbey, as your cousin. Definitely. <laughs> and as all, my lord, the opposition may examine the witness. Mr. Duncan, you were not on very good terms with the late Mr. Farr, were you? Uh, we had one little tiff, sir. How long did that tiff endure, sir? About 45 years, I think. <laughs> Do you remember the occasion for this little disagreement? <laughs> uh, as one of small boys, we... Uh, had a, a fight over a plum cake. Oh. With what result, then? He uh, loosened one of my teeth. So what did you do to him? <laughs> well, if you will pardon me, my lord, I, I tore off some of his clothes. You remember all this after 45 years? Oh, very well. I even remember... Uh, well, you even remember what? Uh, I'm not sure that I care to say it in Nick's company, sir. <laughs> you may be the judge of that, Mr. Duncan. Well, uh, when his shirt was torn, I I clearly observed that Priam had two moles on his person, two moles on his left collarbone. Moles, eh? Very interesting. Now, was there anything distinctive about these two moles? Oh, no, just moles, I should say, plain, everyday sort of moles. That is all, Mr. Duncan. My lord, I should like to call Mr. Priam Fowl to the witness stand. Oh. Mr. Priam Fowl, if you please. Sit down, dear, and be polite. I haven't the slightest intention of being polite. I hate the Well, yes, well, of course. And now that you have sworn to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, please state your name. Priam Fowl. Are you sure it isn't Henry Lee? Very well, that it's Henry Lee. <laughs> Is it? Either. Well, what are you known as? Both. <laughs> uh, Mr. Leek. Uh, Farl is the correct name, my lord. Very well, then, Mr. Farl. Aren't you interested in the just and equitable solution of this action? I can't honestly say that I am, my lord. But you're under oath. Exactly. Therefore, if I so much as hinted that I cared tuppence what happened to any of these miserable money changes, I should be guilty of the most out outrageous perjury. Now, oh, Henry! Oh, very well, my dear. Does anyone else wish to ask me something? I most certainly do. Oh. 
Mr. Fenwick Duncan has testified that as a small boy, he fought with his cousin Pryor. You would, of course, remember that. I fought with Fenwick many times, utterly defeating him on each occasion. <laughs> Do you also recall his discovery of two small moles on your body? Do you possess any such moles, Mr. Leek? I do. You do? Well, here, on my left shoulder. Then, of course, you'll be good enough to serve him to the court. No, I will not. You refuse? Precisely. You understand, of course, the jury will draw its own conclusions from such a thing. Naturally. Perhaps you prefer to show them just to Mr. Pennington and to me. No, I would prefer not to do that either. Mr. Farrell, don't you think just the four of us might retire to my private room. No, my lord, but thank you very much, Well, then, don't let your collar down a bit. Can't you do that much? Not an inch. Might I ask the reason for this obstinate attitude? My lord, I have testified under oath that my body is uh, afflicted with the mold described, and that, I believe, should be sufficient, since no sane man would claim mold if he didn't have mold. <laughs> My dear sir, under the circumstances... Lord, it, it, it happens in this particular instance that the moles are situated in a relatively decorous precinct of my anatomy. <laughs> but supposing that they were not so favorably located, would I still be importuned to unclose myself publicly if the moles were... I think, sir, we have heard enough for today. This court adjourned until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs> Very nicely in court, dear. And thank you for being so polite. It isn't any use, you know. You mean tomorrow? What can they do tomorrow? Well, they'll call you back and simply ask you if I've got the moles. And if I tell them... The case is over. It's goodbye to Putney, to peace and quietness and happiness. Goodbye to everything. Goodbye to me. Alice, I forbid you to even harbor such a thought as a lone voice. It's all right, darling. I think I know now just what to do. The papers that evening all but leapt out of the newsboy's hand. Lloyd's of London office two to one. No more. Charles Moles debated in the House of Commons. American claims record of 105 moles. And the following morning, Mrs. Leak was called to the witness box. But this Mrs. Leak was not Alice. You've uh, just testified that your name is Mrs. Henry Leak. Yes, sir. Have you not? Yes, sir. Yes, now, go on. But I'm the original. There are two of us, sir, but I am the original. May I ask where your husband is now? In the third row, sir. But uh, he didn't have that beard when I married him. <laughs> That's something else he picked up. You're positive this is the man? Yes, sir. That's my enemy, all right. Mrs. Leake, will you please tell the court whether that man had any uh, bodily disfigurements? Big part. Well, had he any birthmarks? No, sir. Now, think, Mrs. Leake. Had he any, say, moles? No. Yes, did he have any moles? Where? Anywhere. No, sir. None at all, is that correct? No, sir, not one. My enemy's complexion was smooth as velvet. I often used to say to him, Henry, I'd say, your skin is just like a bell. Just a moment, Mrs. Uh, 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 Mrs. Farrell, if you have anything to say, you will please step into the witness box. Don't go, Mrs. Lee. Do you have some additional testimony to give, Mrs. Farrell? Yes. Sir, I'm come here. Lord, I protest against such an irregularity. Don't be a stick. Just a minute, Alice. I'll just listen to what you Now, 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 now. Hold still. I wonder what to do your shirt and collar. He's very shy, you know. Now, if you'll just hold up your beard a bit, that's my boy. Now then, Mrs. Lee, if you'll have a look, please. Oh. Oh, my. Smooth as velvet, eh? Are they real? How dare you? Well, my lord, <laughs> what do you think? Are they? The trial collapsed. My client, Lady Vale, withdrew her suit and went home to cherish her 21 genuine and original files. And in Westminster Abbey, certain alterations occurred whereby... The earthly remains of Henry Leake were removed to less auspicious but more appropriate surroundings. 
As for Priam Farr and Alice, well, they disappeared. Simply disappeared. Oh, once in a while, I get a sweet note from Alice along with five or six more paintings. The address is a tiny island somewhere up the coast of New Zealand. All right, waiting at the church, waiting at the church, waiting at the church. Luncheon, dear. Another moment too soon. How is it going, the new painting? Oh, it is just another masterpiece, as usual. What are we having for lunch? Kangaroo chop with crocodile sauce. Excellent, my dear. Excellent. Oh. 